Okay, we are recording everyone. Hello. I'm very excited because today I have two guests on my channel. Some of you may recognize Dr. A.P. Canavan, uh, who is my partner in crime as we're going through the Malazan Book of the Fallen and the novels of the Malazan Empire. Hello, A.P., how are you today? Oh, pleasure to be here, Dr. Chase. All, always great to be on your channel. And I like how we, we both dressed appropriately. <laughs> Nobody is going to believe me when I say this, but we did not plan this attire. I, I got to my computer, I saw AP in the in the Zoom, and I thought, oh my God, look at how he's dressed. So, uh, so I don't know how that happened, but the stars aligned, and uh, here we are. <laughs> and my other guest, I am so delighted for the first time ever, and I hope this will be the first of many times, I have... Ruth and Bad here to discuss. I am so excited, Ruth and Bad, to have you here because A, I, I, I have so much respect for your videos. I think you've done some brilliant videos on the, the Malazan Book of the Fallen and I just love watching them. But I also happen to know that some of your favorite tales in the Malazan world are the Bokelain and Corbel Brooch novellas. So I have been for a long time curious about them and I thought it would be so much fun to have you come and help me understand why these are your favorites. Uh, so I'm just excited to have you. Thank you for being here, Ruth and Bad. Thank you for having me, Philip. It's a big honor for me to be here. The respect's completely mutual. And thank you for the state of my attire, right? <laughs> I, 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 I'm used to looking so muscular on camera and you've turned me into a chubby guy, Philip. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right. I hate to break it to you, Ruth and um, you're still a muscular guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do look a little less vascular now, unfortunately. <laughs> you look great, though. You look great. Uh, and I, we are all color coordinated now. <laughs> so uh, we, we probably would fit right in with Bocalane and Corbel Brooch. So uh, I think this would be, this is appropriate. So we are, as I said, we're going to be talking about the Bocalane and Corbel Brooch novellas. And these have been um, put in two collections. So volume one includes Blood Follows and The Lees of Laughter's End and The Healthy Dead. Now I am going to be hosting the discussion on Blood Follows. And we're going to have a sort of preliminary non-spoiler discussion, just a general idea for those of you who have not uh, read the Bocalane and Corbel Brooch novellas. So we're gonna have just a why you should read kind of discussion, a little appreciation of all of the novellas in a very non-spoiler way. And then we're gonna talk about Blood Follows here today on my channel. And then we are going to discuss the other two novellas that are in this collection. And um, we're gonna have uh, Ruth and Bad is gonna be hosting our discussion on The Healthy Dead. And AP is going to be hosting our discussion on his channel, A Critical Dragon, on the Lees of Laughter's End. So be sure to check out those discussions and check out their channels. Both are fantastic channels, wonderful content, great analyses on those channels. Uh, so as I've talked about both of them before, huge respect. So are you guys ready? Okay. Absolutely. So I, actually the first thing I wanna ask you, Ruth and Bad, if you don't mind, is uh, in a non-spoiler way, uh, because I wanna give our audience just sort of a general idea of what these stories are about. Why are these among your very favorite Malazan tales? So two reasons. The first is that this is a complete sort of, it's a completely different type of writing. It's a completely different type of narrative and sort of uh, just a storyline style that few people would guess Steven Erickson has written if they hadn't seen that name on the cover because these are so different in many ways. There are similarities, obviously, yeah. but they're also so different. They're funny and they're morbid and the different types of humor that Erickson manages to sort of uh, succeed in making us laugh with is amazing. So as we look at these three stories, we're going to see slapstick humor, toilet humor, morbid comedy, it's so many different types of humor that's, uh, that's typically not 
something that translates well into sort of the literary format is something I found. I, I always have a terrible time when I pick up a supposedly funny book because nine out of 10 books that people tell me are hilarious just turn out to be snooze fests for me. So this is one of those cases where the humor worked because it was so different. There are some similarities with the Pratchett style of fantasy comedy, but it's also got this Ericksonian humor element to it uh, uh, as well. So those are my two major reasons. One is just relishing as an Erickson fan that is capable of this, of entering this alternative dimension as a writer to get into these worlds. And the other thing is that they're funny, plain and simple. Yeah. Yeah, you, there's this, uh, you do see some of this gallows humor in the Malazan Book of the Fallen at times. And it is wonderful that it's there because it's a relief at times from the more serious stuff that's going on. But this, these tales just sort of, it's, it's front and center, isn't it, in here? The gallows humor and uh, the quirkiness. Uh, I mean, these are quirky stories. They're a lot of fun. What about you, AP? What's your take on the tales in a general sort of non-spoiler way? What's great about them and why should people read them? Um, well, humor is, is, is so subjective because, you know, listen to how you have described it. I would have described these as absurdist uh -huh. parodies, that it's um, so much of what happens in it is, uh, what's, what's the old expression, dialed up to 11? Yeah. that this is the exaggeration of things uh, and the tone is so darkly uh, darkly comic that you're talking about these really, really dark comedic elements that sometimes you're reading something and you go, how can I laugh at that? I am such a horrible person. But it's that style <laughs> of exaggerated horror, that the exaggerated parody, and each of the books, uh, each of the novellas that we're talking about actually has a sort of specific parody or target. Um, and so each of these novellas is actually very, very different to the other ones that we're going to be discussing. Yeah. Um, and I don't feel that it gives anything away to describe the, the thing that is being satirized, the, the thing that the parody is of. Right. So, for instance, Blood Follows is very much the detective story parody yeah the lease of laughter's end is the ghost story on a ship parody <laughs> and then the healthy dead is a parody of i suppose you could call it new age uh health fad the, that that sort of faddish uh health craze that sweeps the society that's the target of the parody of the satire yeah and it is always dial uh, exaggerated to such an extent that these absolutely horrific terrible things happen and it's darkly comic so we have instead of heroes these are you know the titular characters as you'll see in the description are necromancers they're evil they they, they are not heroes they're not anti-heroes they are villains and so we have these villains going on adventures um so it is in some ways, yes, part of the Malazan world. It is in that world setting, but it is not part of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. It is not part of the novels of the Malazan Empire. This is an entirely different way of looking at the, yes, it's connected to the setting, but these things, you don't need to have read the Malazan Book of the Fallen to read these. You don't need to have read Ian C. Esselmont's Path to Ascendancy or the novels of the Malazan Empire. These are self-contained parodies that can be read as um, these absurdist, dark stories. Brilliant, yeah. And in, in addition to the titular characters, the the necromancers, uh, Corbelain, uh, Bocalain and Corbel Brooch, I'm gonna do that several times, so just forgive me in advance. Uh, How dare you, Philip. <laughs> I, I also love this character, Emancipor Reese, who is, in some senses, he's us, right? He's he's the everyman. He's the one who's, uh, you know, has to has to. He is the the. You've met him if you've read uh, Memories of Ice. Uh, he is the the servant uh, who goes around with Bocalane and Corbel Brooch, and <laughs> he is such. He adds a comedic element to this whole thing, but he's also the, our eyes in in some respect. Um, so. I, I love that element in there as well. The fact that we have this everyman who is, 
who shares our terror uh, and uh, through through whose eyes we we laugh. And he's you don't meet him as much. You don't get to know him as much. We get a bit of his backstory, uh, particularly in in um, the Blood Follows. So he's a character that I enjoy very much as well as as the two necromancers. So he's the heart and soul of the stories. You could argue yeah. that he is essentially the heart and soul that. Baukulain and Cobal Brooch are the sort of the cool gimmicks that we're all here for, but they've got to be preserved. You can't have Baukulain and Cobal Brooch on, on every page. And that's one of the sort of the subversions that I enjoyed as well, that these stories are actually about Mansi, yeah. in, in essence, because if, if, even when you sort of, uh, you're right that he starts off as an everyman. But by the time we get to some of the later stories, we see him thinking on his own. We see that he's competent and there's a, there's a certain dynamic that follows with, uh, especially between Reese and Baukulain, because uh, once again, the title Baukulain and Cobal Brooch is again a bit of a subversion because huh. this is much more about Baukulain and Emancipal Reese. Huh. Most of the stories are a lot more about Baukulain and Emancipal Reese, uh, especially these three, because most of the actual conversations and Baukulain's wisdom, which I'm a total sucker for, that's the sort of that, that that's what really drives me. In fact, as AP was saying, dear villains, I wanted to nod my head in agreement, but I've been so brainwashed by Baukulain by now that uh, I just see him as an objective force because I, I find his uh, rationale convincing no matter what he does. So yeah, uh, Reese is the sort of the heart and soul and the bond between Reese and Baukulain is a, is a very surprising one, but it's also a pretty uh, uh, entertaining and profound one. But I don't know if you guys agree. That uh, the relationship is is fantastic. Corbel Brooch being the sort of the silent presence there. Uh, he's important and by his silence in a way. I mean, he very, he's very the force of nature. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Although I don't know which one is scarier in a way. I think I would have to be a little more wary in some ways of Bocalane than of Corbel Brooch because Corbel Brooch is scariness is obvious but Bokelain I think he there's some there's some hidden depth there perhaps I don't know what do you think AP well um just as as Ruth and Bad was, was talking there if you remember that we have a whole host of stories uh within English literature of things like Jeeves and Worcester the, yeah. the master servant relationship yeah. uh, even the the comedy series Blackadder where you have Blackadder and his servant Baldrick yeah you know there, there's a lot of this the, the master and the servant relationship that's being explored and that that bond that that way that relationship is not necessarily a one-way street but a two-way street that there's there's give and take in it and there's a lot of comedy there and i think blackadder is if you're aware of the 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 tv show is an excellent example of this because again some of the the themes explored there were very, very dark, particularly the, the last season of it was about World War I and being in the trenches, that this is uh, playing up to that very dark humor, detailing some, some very grim things, yeah. but using gallows humor, using that as a way for us um, almost to, to laugh in the face of death, to, um, to laugh in the face of the, these horrors that are part of our world, but we need a, a way to approach them. And one of those ways is through the lens of humor um, because it allows us to take that step back mm -hmm. and, uh, and find a way to negotiate it. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when you think about what laughter is and how perhaps it has evolved. I, I, I wonder what uh, Stephen Erickson's thoughts on this would be actually as an anthropologist but laughter is an interesting phenomenon. I'm not sure entirely why we know laughter evolved, but there's some interesting theories about it being a response to pain, for example, being a response to fear. And you think about it in those terms and there's some depth as well. This isn't just laughs and fun. And like you said earlier, AP, the satire element in here is actually pretty sharp. It's really sharp stuff. I thought it was most obvious in um, The Healthy Dead, uh, honestly. I thought that the satire there was just really good. My favorite work of satire ever. Yeah. I yeah. just love it. Yeah. It, to be honest, uh, my favorite work of satire might be A Modest Proposal, but oh, you know, I, I, yeah. I may be biased towards that given the subject matter. Yeah. But 
the the satire here uh, is it's not biting it is razor sharp at times like it is so it, sometimes i think it, it's not cutting close to the bone it's gone right through the bone it's taken out a chunk of marrow and come out the other side <laughs> but, um and but this is one of the issues with both satire and humor that some people will find it to be enough some people will find it too much and some people will find it not to be enough it humor and satire are always going to be perspective uh, dependent and will always be based on uh, a personal experience and your own sense of what is funny and the blend of slapstick in here uh, as well as the wordplay as well as the witty dialogue as well as references to other genres and, and films and other stories there's a lot going on so i can understand the the comparison maybe to pratchett if Pratchett was in some way horror, instead of being fantasy, if Pratchett had done horror and had gone that route, and instead of putting in you know, biting social satire that we find in Pratchett, but then had really gone for the jugular yeah. to rip out your throat while you're while you're reading. So it's uh, there are I think uh, aspects of comparison there. Yeah, brilliant. Any other general observations on the tales before we move on to a spoiler filled discussion of Blood Follows? I was just going to say AP's sort of uh, comparison of the Baldrick and Jeeves analogy was uh, great because in some senses, uh, Mansi has shades of both where he is uh, on the surface Baldrick, but he also has shades of Jeeves sometimes where he, as we will see in some of these stories, where he acts on his own and he pulls off some pretty uh, amazing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of the devil, of Emancipor Reese and uh, his, his story, um, let's talk about... Blood Follows, and uh, this is the first of the tales. I believe it was the first one that uh, Erickson wrote as well, um, if I got that correct. I think so, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and it, it really is, in a way, the story of Emancipor Reese, uh, because, uh, so everyone, just to be warned, if you if you don't want to hear spoilers, we're going to talk spoilers now. So thank you for coming and, and hearing what we had to say about the tales and hope you read them. They're a lot of fun. I was laughing out loud while reading these. So um, I, I highly endorse them and I'm sure my colleagues here do as well. So well, that's because you're a bad and horrible person, Philip. How can you I laugh am. at this stuff? I am, I, I you know, I, you oh. know that, you know that by now, AP, you, you've, been, you've been sitting here talking with me, putting up with my evil ways for so long. I, I <laughs> so yeah, you know me through and through. The the mean taunting that I, you have been subject to as well from me is just I don't know how you put up with me. But that's anyway. exactly what we think when we think of the two of you, Philip. We think of you as the bad one and AP as the good one. That's exactly what we think. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, all right. Well, you look. I think we're, it's appropriate that we're we're wearing these colors. You know, I mean, that, there's a statement right there, perhaps, uh, about humanity <laughs> in general. So, blood follows. It's the story of a man support, this, or, or as they call him, um, Mansi the Luckless, because this poor guy has this uh, track record of whoever he works for ends up dead. <laughs> so, I mean. Geez, he's he's had it hard, and he's in this marriage where he's pretty sure that at least some of those kids are not his own. And she's his wife is a bit of a bully. Uh, is that is that fair? I mean, I don't know. Um, she's a bit of a bully, and he's uh, kind of down on his luck. And and what does he do? He finds uh, out through his buddies one of whom may be the father of one of his children, I think. There, that's pretty, pretty there's clear, no right? maybe about it. It yeah. is confirmed in the story yeah. that one of his friends yeah. is the father of at least one of his children. Right, right. And he was thinking, gee, you know, this guy, I, I, there is a resemblance there, uh, but you know, so, but I love the way uh, Mansi takes that. He's like, you know, well, I've been, I've, I've had jobs where I've been gone for a long time and who's to blame her? She's, you know, she, I'm sure she got lonely, that sort of thing. So, but anyway, he, he, they tell him about this, this job, this notice that's been put up uh, for a, a manservant. And 
he goes to, and there's something special about the notice of course because it's um it has a what is it a curse on it or something if somebody removes it there so there's a seal on it a seal right and 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 usually the seals apparently would do minor things like give you warts and hair loss and things like that is, and this once again goes back to one of the points that uh, ap raised in one of his previous videos of magic and technology needing to have an impact on daily life because when you think about wards, when you think about the concept of a ward in fantasy literature and in a fantasy world, we've got to see them everywhere. And we've got to see them for normal day-to-day -day sort of applications. And what's happened here is the ward that's put on the notice on a lamppost is uh, the punishment is death if you take it off. And Emancipa even notes that the, uh, that the note will outlast the post because nobody's going to pull that off. Yeah. yeah. So that's so what it was. That's a clue right there that these might be some employers you might not want to work for. <laughs> because, so, but he's totally drunk, of course, when he reads this notice. And consequently, <laughs> he, he, as uh, in that particular inebriated state, he somehow finds the courage or maybe he lacks the presence of mind or whatever to go ahead and apply for this job because he's somewhat hard up at the moment as well. So. Uh, it's a great setup to the story. And of course, you've got a lot more going on here. As, as you said earlier, AP, there's a, there's a mystery in this as well. And you have, what's his name, Sergeant Gold? Is that the, uh, yeah, he's the, the, the detective in this story, if you will. Um, so you do have a bit of a, a, a detective fiction satire going on as well, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's similar, it's not a police procedural. If you think more like the Hercule Poirot, Agatha, that Agatha Christie style, except instead of always being with the detective who's trying to solve this case, right. you're more involved on the, the other side of it, of someone, uh, a manciper, walking into a detective story and then realizing that the people he's going to become a manservant to are potentially the people committing this. They're certainly right. the major suspects. So it's flipping the Agatha Christie mystery sort of on its head by putting you with one of the major suspects as a point of view. Right. Instead of, you know, following the, um, the inspector around as Poirot solves all of this. God, we do get Gold's perspective, but it's a parallel narrative to Emancipor finding a job and what else is going on. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I, I mean, okay, so there are a couple... Um, hallmarks of Erickson's writing that you definitely see in these stories. The convergence sort of thing happens in these stories. Uh, and yes, there you can read these stories in an afternoon, each one, you know, but these, he still manages to get this convergence kind of thing going on. Also, the atmospherics in here are just amazing. I mean, Erickson's, I've said it many times, his prose is just brilliant. I loved the opening to this with the bells peeling and all of that. And this, this place called the Lamentable City of Mall. Is that how you say it? Grinding with doll? Yeah, yeah. M-O-L-L. -L. The Lamentable City of Mall, which is built on grave mounds of all things. And, and the, uh, <laughs> the use of nails uh, that it, it will come up in the, 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 um, the second story as well. I mean, the atmospherics in here are just fantastic. The, the haunted atmosphere of this city and it's a real down and out kind of place as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the tone of it is such a perfect balance of that dark morbid sense of foreboding and this zany humor at the same time, even as uh, Emancipor takes the note as he was, he's drunk and he, as he approaches Baukele and so the two drunk friends refer to him as the, or joke about him being the herald of death. And he jokes about himself being the herald of death as well, which I find interesting because somewhere down the line and then when they meet, Baukele says, I foresee you uh, dying with a laugh on your face. Or yeah. something like that. So there might be a lot more. There might be a lot more to that, where maybe Emancipus is the one who finally sort of uh, gives these to their comeuppance or something, right? Because they keep escaping the consequences of their actions, which is a theme once again with with which is a contrast to Erickson's other work. But in, just in terms of the atmosphere uh, itself, so there are red herrings, as with any good sort of uh, detective uh, uh, story, and just the way in which the parallels in which at the end, sort of 
Gold does do a good job wrapping things up because from his perspective as a detective, he does solve the crime. And he does get there at the end to the scene of crime to apprehend the criminal. He just happens to be extremely outclassed. And just the way that he tracks them down using the lanterns with the terraces, it gave me a... So for me, Memories of Ice... Uh, told the Hounds, Gardens, all those Darujistan books always gave me a very, very satisfying urban vibe. Uh, uh, whenever something set in Darujistan, I can just see the rooftops and the lanterns and people kind of uh, scurrying around and the shadows and uh, and all that. Lamentable Mall gave me that same feeling yeah. of this this uh, sort of uh, noirish, but at the same time, fantasy, morbid comedy, anything could be lurking in the shadows. In fact, I would be interesting to, it, it would be interesting to ask someone who's read these books without reading Memories of Ice, uh -huh. because we know it's, we know it's Cobalt Roach the minute the sort of the, uh, the warlock or the major or whatever says, it's a man, but there's something off. So we know immediately that it's Cobalt Roach. But someone who hasn't read Memories of Ice wouldn't know that. So at what point would they realize that this was the sort of the way that things would turn out. I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I'd love to hear that perspective. That would be really interesting. Somebody who hasn't read the Malazan Book of the Fallen and encountering this for the first time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, um, to, to go to a comparison, actually, to, to Pratchett again, if yeah. you think of Galt being very similar to Samuel Vimes, the head of the watch, uh -huh. and uh, Lamentable Mole being kind of like Ank Morpork, except it's evil, distressed, haunted, dark, dismal cousin. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it evokes that very similar sort of feeling where you have that well-trodden, well-worn city that yeah. it doesn't feel like this city has been freshly constructed for this story. This is a city that has existed for centuries right. and is slowly sliding into the burial mounds and the swamp and yeah you you get a real sense of distress and use to it um, and all of that is evoked through erickson's prose yeah. of you know almost these fog-filled cities if you think back to anytime someone does a, a jack the ripper victorian noir right. you have the, the dark cobbled streets and then the smoke trail coming in and the light breaking it they, that's the the evocation of tone and style that we get in this. Yeah, it's brilliant. And the fact that you have homes that collapse into grave mounds and everybody just sort of, oh yeah, you know, that house down the street, you know, and that's how the citizens take it. And you have something like the street of dolls, right? Where, oh, oh my goodness, <laughs> what an element to have in this story where you have these creepy dolls. And of course you're with gold and, you get to the very end of the street. We're at the bottom of the barrel, so to speak here. And he finds out what those dolls are made of. And boy, is that the creepy. And it, it's even creepier because there's an attraction going on there too at the same time. What, what- uh, He goes back. Yeah. It's good stuff, right? Yeah, and, and even though that is a, so, I mean, these are spoilers anyway. Even though that's a red heading, that just adds so much to the sort of the, yeah. Uh, the morbid and at the same time, the sort of, I mean, think about it. The only two sort of love interests, quote unquote, sexual interests, whatever in the story, right. uh, what gold and this uh, uh, creepy doll collector have. Right. And uh, Cobalt Brooch, I mean, who would have thought Cobalt Brooch is the only one with an actual love interest in the story? Because uh, the princess whom we initially think is the sort of the whatever conventional fantasy princess who's been sort of uh, flustered by the murder and all that. She is in love with Cobalt Brooch because he is a necromantic serial killer and right. she loves the taste of blood or whatever. So those are the only two actual bits of romance that we see in this. What more can we say about the story that, that uh, sort of encapsulates the tone so well? I mean, you have to be comfortable with stories that expose human fears and urges at the most primal level in order to appreciate these stories. Uh, so the fact that you have all these things sort of mixed up together and, and yeah, the princess who's, um, yeah, her deal there, <laughs> it's, um, it's interesting, but yeah, I, I love the way it's done. I, I, and with the humor and everything else, it's just, uh, it is both 
I don't, I don't know if mockery is the right word. I don't think it is actually, but it is a tribute in a way to humanity as well. I mean, it is exposing us for what we are and all of our contradictory glory and shame, I suppose. But we, we also have a, a strong tradition, particularly in the late 20th and early 20th, uh, 21st century yeah. of dark fairy tales where yeah. we have had retellings, uh, sometimes ostensibly going back to the original folk tales, if, right. if such a thing actually existed. You but like Brothers Grimm. A, these, a lot of these retellings of uh, folk tales where Snow White uh, is actually a vampire, where um, the Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf takes on, and the, the wolf takes on a lot more of a sexual predatory investigation of these things. So these are all sort of horror adaptations. So you get a lot of that filtering into this uh, particular set of novellas that it right. is in kind of that part of the tradition as well yeah. of doing the dark horror comedy version of these things. And it it falls into that where we see that in horror, the combination of sexuality, uh, e exploration of sex and violence yeah. all wrapped up together in this sort of package of the darkness of what humans are. Yep. You could also argue that these modern writers are simply making more explicit what was already in those original stories. You know, for example, Anne Sexton's uh, poem Cinderella uh, is a great take on the, the fairy tale. Uh, it's sort of a feminist reading of it as well. A uh, wonderful poem. So yeah, that, that there is a tradition of that. And I, I love that insight that this is uh, simply a, a, an example of that. Excellent. Anything else, uh, Ruth and Bad, uh, about this particular story? Uh, as I said before, there is a convergence of a sort that happens at the end where all these elements pour in together into one finale. Um, and you have the people who are chasing after um, Bocalane and Corbel Brooch as well. I have a feeling they're gonna probably turn up in some future stories since Bocalane opted not to kill. It's funny how once in a while he'll, he'll have a, um, is that an act of mercy uh, that he doesn't kill the mercenary who was after him in, the, in, the, in that final scene? Or what? He says it was indifference. Indifference. Is he rubbing his nose? He, say, he says it's not mercy that makes me spare you. It's indifference. You are yeah. a pest. So he's rubbing his nose in it. But um, think, uh, do you remember the film Silence of the Lambs or the, or the book Silence of the Lambs and, and that whole series about Hannibal Lecter? Hannibal Lecter is a sociopath. Like, he, I don't know. Serial killing sociopath. He, he cares about no one. And right. yet there are some times that he spares people. And it's not because he's exhibiting mercy. It's just, it's whimsical. He just felt like it at the time. It's yeah. not mercy. And I think Hannibal Lecter is a great way to think about Bocalin hmm. because a, Lecter exhibits this um, suave, sophisticated, learned sort of, oh yes, I, I know exactly the place setting for all the silverware. And this is how what you should serve this wine with this course. Right. And it's that very intelligent um, approach that can be very, very attractive. And yet at the same time, he is an absolute monster. Mm -hmm. Monsters like Corbel Brooch are very obvious. He's a, a eunuch who looks monstrous, uh, who is monstrous, who's a necromancer. And then you have the urban, sophisticated Bocalane who, well, is he a monster? Yes, yes, he is. He, he's a monster. So the, just, just because he's more socially acceptable right. doesn't make him any less of a monster. Well, there's a possible um, message there, isn't there? The paradox of the civilized monster. And, uh, you know, they're <laughs> maybe the people who think that they're not monsters because they're civilized could take another look, perhaps. So, yeah. But, but, but guys, you know, I mean, there's just, there's just this evil eloquence about him. There's just this amazing yeah. deviance about him. And he's got this, he's a philosopher and a lawyer wrapped in one, especially when he sort of takes stock. I just like, I live for those quotes, right? Uh, I can just, 
live on Baukulin quotes alone. If you look at what Ericsson's done, uh, because it's just gold whenever he opens his mouth. And even in that moral thing, yes, he is a monster. I'm not here to deny that. I'm absolutely not here to deny that. But there is a there is a certain sort of there's a certain logic and reason behind all his actions. It's self-serving. He, he's, he's ruthless. He's heartless. But he's not exactly uh, cruel, I guess. I mean, I think I guess the Hannibal Lecter sort of uh, uh, analogy is pretty good. In fact, one of my favorite uh, Baukulain mov- uh, uh, moments is from Ericsson's recent Facebook story, where we find out in a small sentence that he had a dog once and he really wow. cared for the dog. Yeah. And when they put the dog away, he was mad. Uh, I was like, yes, this is what I wanted. I know, but hang on a sec. In that latest one that that Ericsson put up, why does Baukulain like the dog? It's not that he cared for the dog. He liked how it could terrorize the neighborhood. He liked the <laughs> Fair enough. It was. Fair enough, but he did. But, but he did care about it. He did care because he does. He 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 does not care about his demons. The gauge that he puts on his demons, he himself is uh, sort of uh, removed from that. He sees them as tools. So I'm um, I'm just trying to represent my client here and bring some humanity <laughs> to him, right? Please. It's tough to represent a sociopath, uh, I guess. I, I feel for you. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I think the comparison to Hannibal Lecter actually works very well, because yeah. if, if you think of those books, there are so many scenes in it where Lecter comes across as really engaging and you're brought along by his logic, by his way of thinking. And you're like, oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that sounds right. That's a- Hang on a sec. Have I just agreed to murdering all of these people and eating their livers? Right. Let's back up a little bit. He is suave. He is sophisticated. He is persuasive. He's intelligent. And he he can be convincing. But it's to take a step back from it and go, but he's still a monster. And where Erickson sort of parodies the monstrous other that we see in horror all the time in Corbel Brooch, right. this is exploring someone who is in some ways so much more insidious, so much more monstrous because they can hide in plain sight. Just on the uh, Hannibal Lecter and Baukulain, one last thing. If either of you have seen the, uh, the Hannibal uh, television show, either in the first or second season, there's a serial killer that Eddie Izzard plays in that, who both looks and speaks exactly like Baukulain. He's a serial killer as well, and he's a much more extroverted version of uh, Hannibal Lecter, and uh, that always reminded me of Baukulain, so I should throw that in there. Nice. All right. Well, anything else to say? I, we have two more stories to cover, so we probably, in the interest of time, should get moving on. But I do want to give you two, one last opportunity to say anything you wish about Blood Follows. Read Blood Follows. It will be worth your time. Please. Re- we need this group to become bigger. Please. Yes. Yeah. If you're a fan of the Malazan books, you'll have a lot of fun with these. They're just, uh, they're fun. And they can also get you thinking a bit as well. So final words. Uh, the, the one follow up I would say is don't read them just before you go to bed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for that sage advice. And with that, <laughs> we will say goodbye and we will see you on A Critical Dragon and Ruth and Bad.